in in our series uh we are speaking to you here from yester which is uh on the ancestral lands of the abeniki uh now known as waitsfield vermont but we're going to be hearing from ian quait who is down in Brooklyn, uh, and I'm really excited to hear what he has to say about the Gowanus Canal and um, the life below the surface. Um, I learned today that the Gowanus Canal is named for Chief Gowane, who was the leader of the Lenape tribe called the Canarsi, mm -hmm. who farmed the banks of the waterway back in the 1600s. So I'm curious uh, to know more about the life that is on those banks now. So I can't wait to hear what um, Ian has to tell us. Um, just a little bit about Ian. He is uh, the director of Fruit Studio, a design practice that explores the intentional ecology in constructed environments. And it sounds like today we might be hearing a little bit about the unintentional ecology also. Um, he earned his Master of Landscape Architecture from RISD in 2011. Um, he teaches some landscape design courses for us. He has worked in design, fabrication, and horticulture in New York, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and Australia. He's widely published and speaks uh, for some very distinguished organizations. So we're really thrilled to have him be part of our speaker series. A uh, few details on the evening. Uh, the talk will run from 6.30 to 7.30, roughly. Uh, and we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. We will manage uh, both the Q&A from the drafting studio where we have some students assembled as well as from uh, folks attending online. Uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat um, using the Q&A feature. Um, I think for the people who are on site, we don't have to explain to you where the bathrooms are. Um, we do want to announce for anyone who is in Washington County in Vermont that we have a standby for locals program. Just as a reminder, we offer 50% uh, off of our courses to honor our community members and encourage our community members to join our courses uh, when we get close to the time of the course and there's still availability in the course. So please stay tuned and, and keep looking on the lookout for that. Um, so without taking any more time, I will hand it over to Ian Quaid. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, I accidentally <clears throat> uh, muted my video and now I can't unmute it. Let's see here. There we go. Um, all right. Well. Thank you very much, Britton, for that introduction. And uh, thank you to Yestermaro for having me tonight. Um, look forward to um, speaking with um, with someone with some of y'all folks later uh, with a Q&A. So um, um, like Britton said, um, we are landscape designers at Fruit Studio. Um, and tonight, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, what's gone into informing my environmental perspective, um, which is largely grounded in natural history, conceptual art, um, and the learning that comes from uh, hands-on experience. Um, <clears throat> so the Environmental Protection Agency started the Superfund program in 1980. Um, and it's essentially where the cleanup costs of a project exceeded that which a potentially responsible party um, is able to afford. And we have about 40,000 Superfund sites in the country. And so this points to an industrial um, legacy pollution that casts a pretty long shadow over our future generations uh, land use. Um, so we'll zoom in on one um, in particular Superfund um, and then um, and then kind of move around talking about um, 
uh, the life of extremophiles and how that's relevant um, to Superfund. Uh, and so here we're, we're looking at the Mid-Atlantic and then coming into New York and Brooklyn and looking at this one particular uh, myelin change long canal known as the Gowanus Canal. Um, and thanks to Autumn Visconti for these images. Um, so the Gowanus is an arterial canal for Brooklyn and for the past approximately 150 years, the canal has been uh, part industrial highway and also part uh, dump. So the EPA promoted the Gowanus Canal to the national priorities list right uh, about when I moved to Brooklyn. And the proposed cleanup process entailed dredging the canal of its sediment and capping uh, with concrete. And so I couldn't help but wonder, as I became more familiar with this process, what was living in the sediment? Um, that had been around for more than 150 years of industrial use, industrial deposits, um, and, and what information will we lose by carting these materials away? Um, because microbial communities are, are really fascinating. Um, and they're also resilient. They are unbelievably resilient. So there's an increasing amount of evidence for ecology, which in the context of tonight, we're gonna to imagine as the study and byproduct of multi-species interactions. So there are increasing amount of evidence for ecology in environments that traditionally we would understand as, and think of as being lifeless. So let's just look at um, geologic history for a moment. A um, little crash course in earth science and, and geomicrobiology, if you will. So on the left, um, we have uh, a sort of cartoon of how we're conceptualized geologic time. Um, we have um, trilobites that down near the bottom and all of these stacked different deposits of fossils, okay? According to the law of superposition, which was a big deal back in the day, um, which basically said that uh, whatever's on top is newer and what's on around the bottom is older. Seems like pretty um, intuitive, but it was a really big deal at the time when we just had cabinets of curiosities and just sort of had fossils willy nilly um, and didn't ever try to sort them or organize or think about um, deep history and deep time uh, in John McPhee's words. So that's the image on the left, which is, you know, clarifying it more kind of like a high school uh, equivalent sort of understanding or when I was in high school anyway. Um, and on the right, we get a little bit more information. So geologic time is divided into eons, eras, periods, and epochs, with eon being the largest geochronological time unit. And as you'll see here, I'm not sure if my cursor works or not, but as you'll see here, there are four eons <clears throat> and three out of the four occurred during uh, the pre-Cambrian, okay? Um, and so 90% of earth history is happening right down here uh, before the advent of shelled organisms. So, Henry VIII is famous for a number of things, uh, foremost of which he was when he selflessly determined that the length of the English yard is the distance from his nose to the tip of his outstretched, outstretched hand. Now, one of my favorite authors, John McPhee, uh, famously said in conceptualizing deep time and the geologic information, um, one single swipe of a nail file on this traditional conception of an English yard, if we thought of this rather, if we thought of this traditional conception of a yard being the distance from, the, from Henry VIII's nose to the tip of his outstretched finger, one single swipe of a nail file removes all of human history. So within these four billion years, including the Hadean, Archean, and Proterozoic eons, 
we have the origin of life, early bacteria, simple multicelled organisms and complex multicelled organisms. And so what's happening in these intervening 4 billion years is the development and diversification of almost basically of all metabolic pathways in biology. And this is all um, happening, you know, before the Phanerozoic, before shelled organisms, okay? So that's relevent um, to, to organisms, to single-celled organisms, which are primarily what are living, well, they're living everywhere and they're living in, um, in superfund uh, environments. And so to conceptualize that, the earth in these early stages was a pretty intense place. So our solar system formed from an accretion disk. And as our planets were cooling, um, there, there, was, there was no life because um, it was too hot. There was also no water. Um, I love these images. <laughs> I'm probably, you know, I just can't help it. Um, so it was inimical to life. The first era, the Hadean, uh, aptly named, totally inimical to life. Uh, because there's no water, because the surface is too hot. Um, but there are storms, uh, electrical storms, and presumably there's some uh, volcanic activity, and there are meteorites. So meteorites carry water and ice, uh, and this is where our oceans come from. Um, so, uh, which is crazy uh, to me when I uh, was reading about that. Um, Maybe it's crazy to everyone, maybe it's not, maybe it's intuitive to some of you all out there, um, but water begins to accumulate as a gas, as sort of proto-atmosphere in this Hadean era um, because the surface is still too hot. So eventually it rains and it rains all of our oceans and thus the Archean era. So there's a, there's a branch of life that's distinct from all other branches called the Archae. And archaea um, live, often live in chemosynthetic environments. And so that's as, as opposed to a photosynthetic environment, which is what we're familiar with, where things are powered by um, radiation from the sun. Chemosynthetic environments are where there is a disproportionate amount of some material that the organisms get near to, and they are powered from that. This is probably uh, preceded photosynthesis. And this necessitates in most organismic contexts a, a sort of unimaginable tolerance for intense environmental conditions. Okay, so this is, they're just kind of like basic uh, environmental setup is something that we would, uh, that's totally unimaginable to us. So our concept of the origin of life revolves around this idea of like the Miller-Ure um, hypothesis where it's like happening in a shallow pond uh, they got struck by lightning or something, which was really just one experiment at the University of Chicago. And in reality, the origin of life probably happened somewhere like a deep sea hydrothermal vent. And these are now fairly well uh, known and still understudied environments that are at the spreading centers um, deep in our oceans, in, in all the oceans. Um, in fact, they just discovered them in, in the Antarctic and Southern seas, which was a pretty big deal. Um, but they weren't discovered at all until the 1970s. And so the, the point is, or the picture I'm trying to paint here is that all early organisms were single cell extremophiles. And life very likely uh, originated in these extreme conditions. Furthermore, many of these organisms are still living with us billions of years after the fact. And so they're in these environments that I'm showing here, uh, you know, deep sea hydrothermal vents, deep sea sediments, continental subsurface, hot springs. Oh, what's over here? Acid mine drainage. Okay, so the organisms don't differentiate between our anthropogenic environments like we do. And so part of the exercise, I think, in thinking about extremophiles in environmentalism thinking about microbes in our built environment is that it's all alive. It's all pulsing with life if we are able to see it. Um, I mean, this slide is basically just sort of underscoring that what's happening chemically is 
can be thought of as mechanistic and can be driven by any sort of uh, substrate, including nuclear uh, waste. You know, there are plenty of fungi that can uh, live on and actually um, sort of isolate and render harmless uh, spent nuclear fuel, okay? Um, but we also have these organisms inside us. Um, for example, in an animal cell here, I'm showing here, mitochondron, Golgi, um, those are all organisms that have their own DNA that reproduce of their own volition inside of our animal cells. Anyway, back to back to New York. So when I saw when I when I moved to New York and I saw the Gowanus Canal with this collusion of 150 years of industrial pollution, combined sewer uh, runoff, all taking place in the context of an estuary, I knew that organisms in the canal sediment were actively metabolizing, processing those self same uh, contaminants that the EPA was targeting for its cleanup. Uh, and so the question was, how, how do we find them? How could we identify them? How can we locate them? How can we share, you know, prove it to ourselves and then share, prove this hypothesis and share the information? So at that time, um, uh, sorry, that, that was a slide that was what I just said. At that time, um, I was fortunate to be working with a lot of really cool people that I still work with. Um, so I was working with volunteering at GenSpace, which is a community biotechnology lab in Brooklyn. Um, and the Gowanus Dredgers, who are a paddling uh, organization on the Gowanus Canal. Um, I was working in an office uh, called Nelson Bird Woltz, which is a landscape architect architecture office um, that helped um, give, basically we donated time uh, and modeling resources to the project. And then we also partnered with Cornell Medical School. So this is kind of the core team here, Matthew Seibert on the left. We were working together at the time, Matthew now teaches at uh, University of Virginia. That's me in the middle. And then Dr. Elizabeth Hanoff on the right, who at the time uh, was at Cornell, and now she teaches at NYU uh, in her own lab. And so the way we started this project is the way we start pretty much every project um, is we made maps. Um, so we used existing surveying conditions. Um, the EPA, we had a few contacts at the EPA that hooked us up with some sediment maps, some, some bathymetry, uh, you know, depth of the canal and of the, of the immediate um, seafloor. And we de decided, it was, it was sort of zoomed in on to 14 sample locations along the length of the canal, including one little branch. And we were looking at um, the, the depth um, because the shallowest uh, location, I think, was about three feet. Uh, and the deepest was about um, 15, I think. Um, so we're looking at depth. We're looking at proximity to the combined sewer overflows, um, light conditions, uh, the industry, the use uh, in the area, and also salinity, which is largely just based on its uh, proximity to open water. So using this map and uh, a bunch of volunteers, we went out and, uh, and started sampling. And so we sampled seasonally for a year as a, as a group, and then a uh, sort of splinter group continued sampling for another year. And we used these DIY uh, devices um, for sampling. Uh, so it's basically just a PVC tube uh, in several links, depending on the area of the canal that you're that we were sampling, with a coupler and a, a clear flexible end, so that you can see once you pull it up that you have indeed some sediment. Um, so it's this was my this is my buddy here and former boss uh, Thomas Woltz on the left and Matthew Seibert here sampling, and we collected all of our samples in autoclave jars and. Um, Note the Tyvek suits. So this started as a bit of a publicity stunt, just to all be dressed the same, uh, exploring, you know, in, in endeavoring into some toxic environment. But when we started sampling, it actually 
really came in handy because the sediment is affectionately known as black mayonnaise, and it is um, very uh, stinky. Uh, it smells like uh, tar oil and um, sewage, um, and but there's sand. It's very sandy, so I would modify it. Black mayonnaise, yeah, so I would call it sort of like sandy black mayonnaise. Um, regardless, we took these samples and then put them, labeled them, um, and put them again into st smaller sterilized containers. I forget the name of these containers, uh, commonly used in biotech, and then brought them uh, to GenSpace to, um, to, extract, uh, to, pur to extract, purify, and then amplify DNA. Um, and taking these on the subway was was pretty uh, was funny. Um, so thinking about um, oh extracting DNA. So th that's that's a fairly um, straightforward process now. Um, where uh, oh sorry I'm not ready for that yet. Where you you follow this this slide here of Ellen Jorgensen who's the the founder of GenSpace, where you follow a, a protocol. Um, and through a series of extractions and purifications and basically a lot of um, uh, running, um, shoot, I can't think of, um, I can't think of the machine right now, um, but a machine that spins material very, very quickly and separates it by weight. Um, through a series of that protocol, you were able to extract DNA um, from the sediment samples and it's all kind of jumbled together. Um, and then we amplify it. So you use a polymerase chain reaction, which is the same thing you use to amplify DNA when you're doing tests for COVID. You know, we talk about PCR, so it stands for polymerase chain reaction, which comes from biotech. So we use that to make a lot of DNA so that you actually can see it. And then we sent that over to Cornell. Um, so again, apologize for the technical details, but I think it's, hopefully, hopefully it's relevant. It's kind of like the design process at this, um, at this scale, this sort of nanotech scale. Um, so we extract the DNA and in the process of extracting it, all of it's jumbled together. It's just genetic material that's in the canal and it's all um, linking back to that particular sample site, okay, for future analysis. And so you, when you're doing sequencing, it's called shotgun sequencing, which is how most DNA is, is sequenced. It, you're taking it and you're dividing it into sort of bite-sized pieces. So a typical read would be 50 to 80 base pairs, um, whereas you know your whole DNA uh, depends on the kind of organism, but it could be it could be a hundred thousand, could be several million base pairs long. So you kind of take them and chop them up and then reassemble reassemble them later according to a reference organism. So these reference genomes are essentially organisms that have already been sequenced and you can, you can compare using uh, a national database, you can compare your sequences to, to this background and it'll say, you have this organism, this organism, this organism present. Uh, but there are so many organisms that have been referenced that you have to kind of tailor it to what you're looking for. And so for us, you know, this is what a typical read from, uh, I don't know what sample site, well, one of our sample sites, but you know, it's just A's, T's, G's and C's. Um, uh, so, you know, basically what we're doing is a digital bio survey. And, um, and so we're, we're, we're creating analytical profiles to search these known metabolic pathways for something associated with hydrocarbon metabolism, right? Because that's, the, all of the goals the EPA is targeting um, are um, hydrocarbons from fuel oil, tar oil extraction that are then dumped. And so those are, are um, problematic uh, and cancer causing, potentially cancer causing um, uh, materials. And so we're, we're looking for organisms that metabolize them, that consume them, because uh, we know that they exist and most of them are archaea bacteria or archaea. Uh, so with those, so we got a, a bunch of results and we made them, uh, more visual. Oops, sorry about that. Um, let's let me readjust my screen. Um, there we go. 
Um, and so I made um, these taxonomic trees to show the results. Um, and, um, and so what you see are, are, are three domains of life. You see viruses, you see archaea, and you see bacteria. And we, were, we weren't looking for animal cells uh, uh, so, or plants, so we're, so we're not having, we're not showing those results because within the scale of these intense environments, it's only single cell. Um, so it's, it's the, this, this tree is divided by family, which is why it all ends at AE. Um, and so here's some of the things that we found. Um, in the uh, disul disul <laughs> disulfobacteriaceae, sorry, my pronunciation is it's not, I don't have these words in my mouth every day, uh, unfortunately, uh, sulfate reducing bacteria that decompose uh, carbon based materials. So these are all anaerobes um, that, uh, which means you live in the absence of oxygen. Um, so these are all marine organisms, which we would expect to find because the canal is tidal. Um, and then those would be sort of like a signature organism of the environment. Uh, and then we also have these methanocetaceae. So these are often found in the human gut. So that points to uh, the, uh, the, the, the sewage that uh, routinely dumps into the canal and into all waterways in New York City, unfortunately. Uh, so that's the way that they were designed. Um, when, if you get more than an inch of rain, we get um, sewage that dumps into the waterway. They're working on it in a number of different ways, but that is the reality for a lot of the, uh, of the city. And then we have also have another, so these are RK. The last one was RK. This is also RK, uh, if you remember from our uh, extremophile um, imagery, uh, our extremophile portion of the talk. So the methanobacteriaceae, these are what we were hoping we would find. Um, so these digest organic pollutants and solvents. Um, so these are relatively common in uh, polluted environments and they actively metabolize um, uh, carbon-based, um, you know, like um, fuel, fuel oils, tar oils. And so uh, uh, arranged along the ring, you can see an associated, sorry, I actually didn't explain that at first. Um, these are our sample locations. So you see one through 14 and these little um, icons indicate where we found these organisms. So our findings are that they're we have species related to the marine environment. Uh, we have species related to the human gut. And then we has a uh, and then we find a reservoir of metabolic functions related to the uh, dissolution of hydrocarbons. Um, so the question then becomes, how do we talk about these? How do we make these findings more digestible? Um, and then how do we design? What, what is there? How do you design with this kind of information in mind? So we took that self same map and we started to look at our sampling sites, one through 14 shown here and here, and then zoom in on particular chemicals or particular products that we are, that, that, we, that the EPA is targeting, that these microorganisms are also targeting and how much performance are we getting at each sample site to digest them? So Cresol, we're getting uh, a, a lot of performance on the 14 sample site, which is kind of unexpected because that's out, um, but but it, something about the marine environment is influencing that, helping that. We also get that at sample site eight. Um, there's arsenate, which we're getting a lot of performance on the very first sample, the most inland. Um, toluene, and atrazine, you know, you can you can see here that we're getting where we're getting those um, information, um, and so we had that sort of infographic, and then we wanted to develop another infographic that was more about design, and so we wanted to create, you know, based on this information, what if we um, created a series of spaces based on the findings of these sample sites, um, with a sort of provocation, you know, like. If the process of micro microreal remediation could become visible and interactive, you know, what would that be like uh, as a sort of park 
uh, or urban place, um, you know, how could we make this information more digestible and um, uh, part of the urban fabric? And so these are nodes uh, according to where our sampling sites were and that we, we, we came up with this concept of a smart doc, um, which says the language is kind of dated because this is from, uh, you know, it's from 2015 now, uh, a lot of this information. Um, so apologies for that. Um, and, and so this is kind of like a detail of one of these proposed smart docs. And so we're showing uh, construction details and essentially how uh, information based on the micro microbial metabolism could be translated into light and color intensity. So translating these sample locations into these sort of lights to give you information about your environment, information about what's happening, information about what the microorganisms are doing that is for, that's good for them because they like that food, but also um, good for us because it's processing these wastes. Um, so the timeline for this kind of work though is, is a bit of a question mark. And this would need to be extrapolated you know, from laboratory testing. But I think we could probably say uh, that it would be in the tens of thousands of years, just given the scale of these organisms. Now uh, that could be, and we did some work exploring how it could be oxidized, how it could be exaggerated, uh, accelerated through design. And I think that's where there's a lot of good design work. But metaphorically, I think it's important to, to consider that, you know, um, to consider what these timelines are like and what this kind of legacy pollution we're creating, um, how long it may actually take. Um, because these, you know, there, there's a concept of a way within the EPA, within the Army Corps of Engineers that doesn't really exist. Just putting it in concrete and putting it into a landfill doesn't actually uh, process the waste. It just isolates it. Um, so what I wanted to do, you know, with this design project is emphasize that um, that while we have these, we have we have contaminated sites all over the place that we we have to deal with, and I'm not suggesting that we don't clean them up because I do think we should be able to be in water. I think I think fish and other organisms should be able to live in all of our water bodies, uh, in industrial, uh, urban, or whatnot. However, I also think it's important to emphasize that some microbes really thrive in these conditions, that these are their kind of Edens. And so these environments, along with acid mine drainages and submarine abyssal, uh, abysmal vent environments, you know, these are their gardens of Eden. And, uh, and so I think we can use design as a tool to make these extremophile environments uh, visible and essentially, you know, hopefully valued for their environmental services and also for their unique ecologies. So this was a, a board that we put together for a, um, for a competition about the Gowanus Canal. Um, and, um, and so we, 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 we won that and we got a fair bit of, of press. I mean, it was an unusual take on it. So we got some press about it. And, and that's, um, and then nothing really happened. You know, the EPA, uh, our contact there, I think he started working somewhere else uh, in the private sector. Um, and um, they are still continuing with that, with that path. Uh, I wasn't expecting that we could influence that path, but I just kind of wanted to uh, influence the way at least a couple designers, whoever was reading Curb thought about it. Um, and so now what we're doing is um, we're trying to publish uh, our findings because the, the sampling has continued and now Elizabeth's lab at NYU uh, is continuing some of the research, uh, some of the quantitative, uh, you know, the computational biology work, work on it. Um, so this is just the you know, abstract from the manuscript that we're kind of shopping around now to some microbiology journals. 
Um, and so that's that's pretty much where the project is now. Um, so I um, I'm definitely uh, happy to answer questions, um, but I'd also would kind of like to ask um, folks in the audience and maybe Britain or some folks associated with Yestermorrow, um, you know, the, within design build schools, there aren't a lot of um, examples of workshops or semester-based approaches to designing and creating gardens that are tailored to specific human-centered needs. Um, and is this something that that you all have seen before or that you all have examples of? Um, so maybe I could, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to turn it around uh, and, and chat about that some. And, and again, I'm, I'm happy to, 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 to field any questions. Ian, will you rephrase that question for us one more time? I was going to say the same thing, Ian, if you could. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. Say I it again, because I uh, design build of landscapes around human yeah. needs, but I, well, I want to hear more about what I went, do. I went sort of uh, unintentionally, seamlessly from talking about microorganisms to uh, asking a specific question. So let me give a quick course break. Um, and show a few books that are related to our, the talk tonight. Um, I borrowed uh, pretty heavily from Lynn Margolis, I think just in my life. Um, she wrote a book, uh, she has a bunch of books that are all good. She wrote a book with her son, Dorian Sagan. She was married to Carl Sagan for a while called Microcosmos. Uh, and Lynn Margolis is a, a, a microbiologist. Uh, that's an excellent book. Um, Fido, awesome book, uh, all about phytoremediation. A lot of really interesting case studies uh, at a, at scale, at industrial scales, um, that are really fascinating. And then uh, Atlas and Material Worlds is Matthew Seibert's first book as the editor. Um, Elizabeth contributes to it an article on the Guanas Canal. I contribute to it uh, with my friend Colleen. Um, on an article about, um, ooh, what, what, what did we contribute? Sorry, this is a while ago, uh, about something in North Dakota. Um, so, uh, so anyway, the, the, yeah, the, the, my question was, um, thinking more about, um, design build as it pertains to sustainability and as it pertains to gardens. Um, that are tailored to our effluents, essentially. You know, we we talk about stormwater um, management, um, which is one of those examples. But um, have you all participated in any classes like that or conceived of anything where we could design and build gardens to address some of these issues? Uh, I'll just <clears throat> chime in by saying I, we don't, we haven't got really gone there. I would absolutely love it. Um, we have some composting toilets that, uh, and we've taught some classes around that, that we can then use um, our moldering toilet systems for mm -hmm. fertilizer. But I don't think um, <clears throat> it's quite entered our pedagogy, but I would love to find ways to make it happen. Um, if I'm sensing a volunteer here. <laughs> you are. <laughs> um, Great. Cool. Okay. I, well, phytoremediation and, and bioremediation and working working with uh, what humans have created, I think, is, a, is an incredibly important aspect to our society and to design build in general and to uh, solutions for our school in particular. So, um, you know, even though we're in Vermont and we're in an area that feels pretty um, clean and pure, you know, nothing is untouched by human hands at this point in the earth. I think we've, we've uh, more or less come to that realization. And uh, so we need to start thinking more about it. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, and, 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 you know, I think, um, you know, my talk was kind of microbe focused, uh, but in fact, 
when we introduce plants, you know, in phytoremediation, we, what we're doing is creating an environment for microorganisms to thrive. And that's largely what we're doing with most plants in urban environments. We're, we're creating this root zone where microorganisms can do the heavy lifting and, and also give uh, nutrients to the plants. So I, th I still think it's, it's relevant, even though we're not dealing with mine tailings necessarily, although I'm sure there are some mines in Vermont, but at a more practical, scalable level, um, I think it would be, yeah, I would love to see more coursework, um, not just at Yes Tomorrow, um, but, it, but um, at, at other institutions that engage with just experimenting um, because there's there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting published work that is at a desktop scale that would really benefit from um, actually coming out in the world, actually having having some hands on um, uh, results um, that could be documented and shared to a wider audience than just you know microbiology journals. Um, do, are there, I'd be happy to ask or uh, answer in, in, any questions or, or if there are other things, uh, you all would like to discuss, I'm, I'm here, I'm here. Well, I've, I have a question, uh, related to your, uh, your work and your project and, and the, um, <clears throat> submission that you made that, uh, got the award or, or was chosen. Um, what, where would you in an ideal scenario, where would you love to see it go? What would you love to see it turn into? What's a, what's a winning aspiration that you see, you know, this work headed to? Well, we, we did some work that I didn't show tonight uh, because I wasn't, I don't know. I think we were, we were all kind of working, you know, I was working for a design office full time. And so the the work that we did after we had a residency at the School of Visual Arts um, in one of their maker labs and I wasn't really that thrilled with the results of that. However, I think that thinking is related to to your question where what we were trying to do is create something kind of like uh, a unitized coral reef where we make something that is, um, like a bioconcrete, like, you know, they, there's, there are some interesting examples of like magnesium based concretes using concretes that aren't so basic, um, and that are more, that are more pH, um, neutral or even, uh, more alkaline depending on the target organisms and essentially putting something that's porous to create more of a, uh, of a sort of like, um, lateral, uh, more dimensional environment to oxygenate and potentially accelerate the metabolism of some of these target microorganisms. So, I mean, that would be really interesting. You know, if we could, the ideal, one of the ideal manifestations of that would be to create the same cap that the EPA, you know, for good reason wants to put so that you can't, if somebody decided to jump in and then dig around that they wouldn't be able to get to this material that would be very bad for their health. So what if we could make that cap out of something that actually like allows oxygen, you know, it has some sort of depth to it that actually enables these organisms to work faster and also prevents us from getting to it. So if it was sort of like a unitized structure like that, um, that was like one manifestation of it that I was thinking about. Actually, I do have some drawings. I should show that. I can send those up. Um, uh, that would be a really interesting manifestation of it. Um, anything that would be deployable to other sites. Um, the other thing we were we were pursuing was just a, a, a basically a biosurvey kit, so that if you live in Peru, let's say and near a, a former silver mine or something to that effect, you could, you, could, you could take one of these kits and sample the sediment, send it to your neighboring, uh, there, there are biotech labs all over the place, send it to a biotech lab and get some results about what's going on there. Um, it just because like, firstly, information is power. And then what we do with that information, you know, I'm not sure, but just, just trying to share um, that there are organisms 
everywhere and that they're probably a pretty unique ecology in each of these manifestations. So if there was some sort of a sort of biosampling kit that made this technology more available and made the awareness with that technology more available, uh, I think that would be a really fun thing to pursue. That sounds great. Uh, thank you, Ian. Those are those are fascinating. I think they'd be <clears throat> two examples in Vermont. There's an asbestos mine with a lot of tailings um, that I think it would be fascinating to study with that with that kit. And then there's a copper mine that's a that's a super fun site. Um, that there's recently been a lot of coverage of the bats that live in that mine. Um, so both of those I think would would give us a lot of material to work with with our Tyvek suits on. You gotta do it. We've got a question from the viewing room at Yes Tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Yes Tomorrow, thanks for your time. Um, I guess my question is other than, you know, general ecological concepts or, you know, keeping in mind permaculture, are there any things we can do from a residential or like urban perspective to, uh, promote or even identify whether we have extreme abiles, you know, in our residential environments to foster or, you know, try to be stewards of? Um, that's a good question. I, I, you know, like, I'm trying to think about what I do it. Um, I mean, I think uh, to me that is, part of the promise of design um, and landscape design in particular, only because we're directly engaging with organisms, you know, as our material, but, but design in general, I think the promise of it is that we are anticipating the way something will be used and we try and kind of codify it in materials, be it wood, metal, concrete, whatever that material may be it um, makes it more permanent. And so that can be for bad or for good. Uh, I think it could be for good um, because what we could do is we could establish uh, a planting bed or we could establish areas where organisms can continue to do their thing and essentially develop their own their ecology without us driving over them, for example, uh, or disturbing uh, their processes. Uh, so I, I would say in general, what I come across a lot in, ur in urban or peri-urban environments are disturbed habitats. And I'm not saying that we should just let things alone that will figure itself out. I don't have that wilderness philosophy necessarily, especially in regards to like the built environment. But I do think that if we can set up um, to the best of our ability, an environment that's that's working, uh, that's either processing stormwater, for example, uh, in a residential setting, uh, potentially processing waste. Um, if we can set up that system and monitor it so that it continues to, to function well, I think letting it do its thing, it will continue to diversify to acclimate to our effluents and the other environmental effluents and become just better and better at what it does. Um, and so, 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 yeah, to, so that's kind of my answer to your question that um, can, I would say ideally we could use design to, uh, to enable an ecology to not be destroyed by our future projects. A follow up. Is there any way, you know, we as lay people can, other than, you know, genetic or DNA sequencing, identify or quantify environments where extreme vials might be thriving, you know, without us knowing, you know, knowing that they want to be doing their best work in their best environments? How do we identify those environments, you know, on an everyday standpoint for, you know, for the purpose of which, you know, environments or locations to design for. Like how can we identify or quantify you know, and know where to put our efforts? That one's a little harder. Um, 
and it it, it kind of depends you know like all of these um extreme file environments are all very well generally they're they're pretty unique um especially like post-industrial environments you know um because pretend you know I, I guess there there would be there would be relationships between the industry that it's um associated with but that's going to be really largely influenced by the geologic parent material by the weather you know a, a, a copper mine and Vermont's going to be really different than a copper mine in Southern California or in, you know, Butte, Montana or something. So, um, so that, that one's, that one's a little bit more tricky because it's very, it's a very unique ecology. Um, but I don't know. I mean, there are probably, um, I'm sure there are, are, Easy, like tests that we could do. I mean, I know like the thing about lichens, for example, you know, like lichens are not going to be everywhere, but they are tolerant of a lot of pollution. They're tolerant of radiation. And in general, you identify lichens first stopically based on um, their colors, but then you also do little acid tests to, to get it to a species specificity. And then that is going to tell you a lot about the environment what what would that particular lichen because if they're very particular with their substrates so again it depends on the environment if there were lichens around that would be really convenient um i would also entertain uh soil testing you know i do soil testing all the time and 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 i mean everyone you know enough people do that it's very affordable you know the soil testing facility i use here uh it costs Twelve dollars, I think, to get a sample um, analyzed, and it's looking for micronutrients. But you could take that particular combination of um, findings and of the soil chemistry and soil nutrients, and and look at like analyze that and probably get a pretty good idea based on inputs of like what kind of organisms are living there, just as a way of getting the ball rolling. And then contacting, I'm not sure, a specialist in that uh, to get to go from there. But but I would say, you know, um, fundamentally, I think soil sampling sampling is a is a very good affordable diagnostic tool that is underused. Great. Um, so I guess uh, my question is, I guess related to. Um, like having this kind of project be scalable, like how um, useful do you think this project will be in studying other urban canals or even in like uh, rural riparian restoration projects? So I know in some like places like Vermont, for example, our rivers have a lot of nitrogen in them, which is kind of like another kind of pollution for more rural environments where they have collected sediments using silt barriers. Um, do you think that these like principles could be usable elsewhere? And do you think there's a group of people interested in funding those kinds of projects? I, I yes, I do. Um, I think that yeah, fun, like most, thankfully there aren't that many like environments that are polluted to this scale, where really only microorganisms can survive. Mostly we have somewhere, some sort of meso scale where it's bad. It's like, it needs to be addressed. Um, but we can do that with plants or we can, we can, we can do that with other structures other than trying to create an environment for microorganisms, which is, can be somewhat difficult in these like very reducing environments. So, so I think, uh, to me, I think it's the, the sort of process, like the mentality of, thinking about uh, my, microbes as, do, as again, as I was saying to Britain, uh, microbes is doing the heavy lifting when it comes to pre preparing um, their um, environment. And so how do we create environments for them? With, generally that would be um, with, with, with soil or creating some sort of a substrate. So like silt barriers, um, there are some pretty cool examples uh, in the Netherlands where they've made all of these uh, kind of floats for piers in the ocean out of rope. 
Um, so, you know, what, what I think is an interesting crossover is that, that we're trying to engage with microorganisms and whatever other scopic organisms, um, we're generally going to be using um, natural materials. So that I think is a kind of cool crossover, with, which is traditional what I would associate with like a design build school where we could use materials that are that are site harvested with a with a different approach, right? Or or with a different potentially an different different end goal where we're trying to actually cultivate on those materials uh, in maybe an unlikely area of like a stream bed. Um, so so it, so in some, I think that the philosophical approach of taking on um, a microbial perspective, a, a geologic sort of like deep time perspective is, is a good lens by which we can find our design for right? Uh, seven seven generations or, or or seven generations or something, but but I think it's still a way of thinking about how we're cleaning up and um, and thinking about the substrates that we're introducing into our environments um, and and what's going to be living on them. That's sorry, that's kind of rambling. Answer. I just got a little pop up that my internet is unstable. Is it, is it okay or? You're cutting in and out a little bit just in your last question, but we got all of the information, I think. Okay. It's okay now, so we're, we should be good. Okay. Um, I think we are done with our questions for this group that I'm seeing here. And if anyone online has a question, feel free to put it in the chat or the Q and A. Um, but seeing no other questions, I'll uh, turn it back over. Okay. Um, Party words. Uh, I, I, I will we'll associate this, and if not, I'll I'll figure it out. Uh, but yeah, I'm 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 definitely open to continuing the dialogue over email or in any other format um, with anyone uh, here tonight. So thank you. Uh, thanks again for having me. And um, and I hope uh, I hope some of what I was saying was was stimulating. Yes, it was. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. Absolutely gorgeous vi uh, visuals and really thought provoking, fascinating topic. Uh, Ian, thank you very very much. Um, <clears throat> yeah, everyone, uh, be sure to continue to stay tuned to our Wednesday speaker series every Wednesday night between now and uh, November fifteenth. Um, next week, we have, I believe it's Friends of the Mad River, uh, again, 6.30 Wednesday. Uh, and to continue to support this series and Yes Tomorrow in general, please uh, always, you can go to our website and donate uh, to support the school and our wonderful thought-provoking programming like this and hopefully support some future uh, courses like the ones that uh, Ian and I seem to want to be able to run to help uh, be able to establish processes to deal with what we humans have and will continue to uh, <clears throat> reap and sow on our wonderful landscape. Well, Ian, thank you very much. Thank you all for uh, your attendance and your attention and uh, we look forward to more uh, thought-provoking uh, conversations. Good night, everyone.